Welcome everyone. Welcome back after a wonderful week. Um, it was a wonderful week, right? If it wasn't, I, I understand. That's okay. Not every week is wonderful, um, but I, I hope that at least some parts of it were good and this next week will be wonderful. Well, we can hope. I'm always hopeful and I'll hope that for you. I've been reading again. I read. I do that. And one of the things I've been reading, if you've been following along, you might know. And if you don't, that's okay, too. You can look back at my history if you want to. One of the things I've been reading is the American bestseller from every year since 1895. And that is because I was looking to see how far back I could go. And the oldest complete list I could find was Publishers Weekly. They go back to 1895. So I am up to the novel from 1899. I've gone that far. Wow, it seems like just a couple months ago I started with 1895 and here we are already. What could this novel be? I know you're just dying to find out. Hmm, let me see if we can figure this out somehow. Oh, <gasps> look at that, it just appeared magic. The best-selling novel of 1899 was David Harum? Harum? I, I'm not sure I've only seen it written. I haven't heard it. I've been pronouncing it Harum, so I'm gonna go with that. I might be completely wrong. David Harum was written by Edward Noyes. Noyes? I'm really doing great here. Westcott. His last name was Westcott. I'm pretty sure of that. So Edward Noyes Westcott was born in 1846 and lived through 1898. He was born and raised in Syracuse, New York. His father was the first president of the New York Dental Society and also was mayor during the Civil War. Edward himself worked in banking until his business failed. Then he became the secretary to the Syracuse Water Commission. In 1874, he married Jane Dowes. They had three children, Harold, who unfortunately died young in an accident, Philip, and Violet. Edward contracted tuberculosis in his later years and in 1895 went to Naples for a rest. And I figured this one out for myself because I read in the book there's a part where one of the characters goes to Naples and it's described in a way where you're going, the author knew about Naples, had been there. It was very nice to look that up and discover that and go, oh, okay, I was right. So during this time, he began writing a novel to pass the days and completed it near the end of 1896. Six publishers rejected it. One said, it's vulgar and smells of the stables. <laughs> what an insult. But finally, it was accepted by D. Appleton and Company. This was at the beginning of 1898. Sadly, Westcott passed away two months later. The novel was published six months after his death and was almost immediately a bestseller. In fact, the book remained popular for a good long while. Even 35 years later, it was second in popularity only to Quo Vadis. This book has had at least two adaptions, one into a silent film from 1915, starring William H. Crane. You can find this on YouTube. Later, it was made into a version in 1934 starring Will Rogers. And once you read the book, you're going, oh, Will Rogers, perfect, perfect casting. Now, in fact, there's a chapter or two in this book uh, dealing with Christmas time, and that has been published as a book in its own right. You can find both versions of the book on Project Gutenberg. Now, as to the book itself, it is a little old-fashioned in its style of narrative, and also particularly in the uh, main characters, there are a few other characters, but mainly it's him, uh, in his way of speaking. He has a broad dialect, and at the time it was common to write that out as it sounds. It's not so much done today. I found this unusual because the novel is set in upstate New York, and I myself am from upstate New York, and I cannot recall anybody speaking in any particular way different from how I am now speaking to you. <laughs> now, all that said, the way this story is told is a little unusual. We meet the main character, David Harm, right away in the first two chapters. His age, I don't think is ever given. I think he's supposed to be about middle 
age. He is stated as being, like, older. But at the time, it could have been about middle age. It could even have been younger. Anyway, he is a banker who lives in the fictional upstate town of Homeville. There is no actual town called Homeville. However, interestingly, Homeville is the name of the historical society shared by the towns of Cortland and its neighboring town, Homer. Now, the author Westcott did in fact have a house in Homer when he was older and had his own family. Now back to the narrative. David Harum lives with his sister. His sister is about his age, a little bit older. She was married. It's never quite clear what happened to her husband when he is referred to as, as a ne'er-do-well. So she may be a widow. He may have run out on her. Anyway, David, it is revealed, is a character of characters. He is a little eccentric. He is prone to rambling stories, and this takes up quite a decent amount of the novel. He's also fond of an opportune horse trade, uh, which part of his stories detail his uh, shenanigans when it comes to this sort of activity. So he's sitting around telling his stories to his sister, and this seems at first the way the novel will go, and you're kind of wondering what the point is. However, they do also discuss a young man who is coming to work for him, John Lennox. The third chapter picks up with John Lennox, who is a 20-something who lives in the big city. He comes for money, or he thinks he does at least. Now, we follow John's adventures for the next so many chapters. John lives with his father. He has never needed to worry for money, and he's been rather shiftless. When we meet him, he has been on a trip to Europe for a year or two, uh, kind of bored, not really finding anything to do there or anything to do with his life, and he's coming back feeling rather unfulfilled. On the trip, he meets a young woman named Mary Blake. They begin a shipboard relationship. Now, both of them are willing enough to continue the relationship when they disembark, but they're both a little wary because you know how those shipboard romances tend to turn out. So Mary particularly is unsure as to whether she wants to continue her relationship at this juncture, so John gives her a little space. His father abruptly passes, and it turns out there's not quite as much money there as John thought there was, so he's definitely going to have to go to work. A friend of his father's mentions that an upstate banker's looking for help in the office, and off go John goes willingly enough. So he finally gets to Homeville in Chapter 12, and David re-enters the story. John is unsure of his employer's motives at first in everything he does, because he's heard talk about this man from the other residents of the village before he even meets him. There are a lot of rumors floating about, around about David and how he may be rather unscrupulous. Now, David isn't always clear about his motives at the outset, because he wants John to figure that sort of thing out for himself. But it does become clear that although he's shrewd enough in a horse trade, David is a good man. He is willing to do a good turn for those who deserve it, and he's scrupulous about paying back his debts, even those that no one else knew about except himself. There are a few spots where this book got emotional. We learn after time that David was once married. His wife died in childbirth. Their only son lived until he was just about six or seven, and then he passed away of a fever or something like that. David was out of town, and he couldn't get back in time to see him. So that, that was pretty wrenching, and David has a few words to say on the subject of losing a child that are just, I'm, I'm not going to read those parts, it's a little too much, but very real, very raw, very, very strong. And that is another thing where it really seems the author's personal experience came into play. Then there is also the aforementioned Christmas story. And this is where David relays uh, a bit about his childhood, which was abusive, and how one person's kindness in one day's events changed everything for him. And he always wanted the chance to repay those debts, which he does. And that is also a very touching part. I'll read a bit of that. Okay, so Dave as a banker has hold of this widow's mortgage. 
And it turns out that he knew her husband. He knew her and her husband for quite some time, but he knew her husband before he knew her. And her husband is the one who did the kindness for him as a child. So David has a hold of her mortgage. She is behind on it. And he lets her know on Christmas that he has decided to forgive the mortgage, completely wipe it off the books. And she goes, oh, I can't ever repay you. And he's saying, I'm repaying you because your husband is no longer here. So by repaying, so by wiping this off, I'm repaying him. And this is what he has to say on the subject. You can estimate, I reckon, he began, what kind of a bringing up I had and what a poor, miserable, godforsaken, scared to death little forlorn critter I was. Put upon and snubbed and jawed at till I come to believe myself what was rubbed into me the whole time that I was the most all-round no-count animal that was ever made out of dust, and what never likely to be no different. Looking back, it seems to me that, except of Polly, his sister, I never said, I never had a kind word said to me, nor a day's fun. Your husband, Billy P. Collum, was the first man that ever treated me human up to that time. He gave me the only enjoyable time that I ever had, and I don't know what anything's ever equaled it since. He spent money on me, and he gave me money to spend that haven't, that had never had a cent to call my own. And, Miss Collin, he took me by the hand, and he talked to me, and he gave me the first notion that I'd ever had that maybe I wasn't only the scum of the earth as I'd been teached to believe. I told you that that day was the turning point in my life. Well, it wasn't the lickin' I got, though that had something to do with it, but I'd never have had the spunk to run away as I did if it hadn't been for the heartening Billy Peak in me, and never knowed it, and never knowed it, he repeated mournfully. I always allowed to pay some of that debt back to him, but seeing as I can't do that, Miss Cullen, I'm glad and thankful to pay it to his widow. That was good stuff. That was good stuff. And... And the, the dialect sounds a little weird, especially, like I say, I don't know anybody in New York who talks like that, but that's how it reads. I was reading it how it would sound. So, back to the emotional parts. There's the separation of John and Mary. Their relationship is excellently fleshed out, and Mary, although being a woman of the time, is no fainting flower. She is a clever and independent woman. So you really want to see these two get together, and they do but not till the end of the book. And in the meantime, there are two poten potential rivalries introduced for John's affections. And both of these are also quite interesting young women who the reader would be okay with him choosing. But we already spent this time with Mary and getting to know her, and they're just so good together, and we want to see them be together. So it's a big relief when they finally do marry at the end of all things. Also, through David's aid, John's financial issues are resolved. He becomes David's partner in business and his future is assured. So like the other bestsellers here to now, this book reads extremely well. And if you're not used to more old fashioned tone, it takes a little getting used to, particularly David's way of speaking, but it's worth it. The story is engrossing and the characters are well fleshed and likable and the story still holds power. I literally went when John and Mary got together. I may actually have went, yes! Yeah. And there are some humorous moments as well as the dramatic, so the novel evens out its journey quite well. There isn't much that didn't age well overall. Again, this is a slice-of-life novel, though seemed very popular at the time. And I can see why. You want to spend more time with the characters, and you'd be glad to read more if the story were longer. It's a shame that Westcott didn't live. Maybe he would have written more in novels and be better remembered today. Speaking of slice of life, here's, I love this part because it still holds true. Chapter three. Master Jackie Carling was a very nice boy, but not at that time in his career, the safest person to whom to entrust a missive in case it's sure and speedy delivery were a matter of importance. But he protested with so much earnestness and goodwill that it should be put into the very first post box he came to on his way to school, and that nothing could induce him to forget it. That Mary Blake, his aunt, confident and not infrequently counsel and advocate, gave it to him to post, and dismissed the matter from her mind. Unfortunately, the weather, which had been very frosty, had changed in the night to a summer-like mildness. As Jackie opened the door, three or four of his schoolfellows were passing. 
He felt the softness of the spring morning, and to their injunction of hurry up and come along, replied with an entreaty to wait a minute till he left his overcoat, all boys hate an overcoat, and plunged back into the house. One more excerpt. I just really like this part. It was like a little comment of the authors on life. Uh, sometimes we writers like to slip those in. Miss Blake sat in a low chair, and John took its fellow at the other angle of the fireplace, which contained the smoldering remnant of a wood fire. She had a bit of embroidery stretched over a circular frame like a drumhead. Needlework was not a passion with her, but it was understood in the Carling household that in course of time a set of table doilies of elaborate devices and colored silks would be forthcoming. It has been deplored by some philosopher that custom does not sanction such little occupations for masculine hands. It would be interesting to speculate how many embarrassing or disastrous consequences might have been averted if, at a critical point in a negotiation or controversy, a needle had had to be threaded or a dropped stitch taken up before a reply was made, to say nothing of an excuse for averting features at times without confession or of confusion. So yes, David Harum, or Harum, by Edward Noyes or Noyes Westcott, however you pronounce it, I definitely recommend it. Yeah, definitely re read this one. Read this one. I, uh, really, I, I haven't had any to not recommend so far. They, they've all been quite worthy of being bestsellers even unto this day. So yeah, look for it. You can buy the hardcover. I'll put down below where you can find it. Or like I say, it's on Project Gutenberg. It is out of print, so you can find it online quite easily. And let me know if you have read it and what you thought of it. And also if you've read any of the other bestsellers so far. And just basically if you've read anything, put it down below. I want to hear from you. As I said before, I hope you have a good week. Read lots. And I will see you next time.